today about several different major areas and try to tie together uh, some effects uh, in the equity markets between risk and return, news coverage, analyst coverage, and really excitement. So at, at, at the core of this, I think, is something that's uh, massive in terms of an inefficiency in the markets. And it has to do with human nature. And it seems to me the only way these, this giant inefficiency can persist is related to human nature and the way that we communicate. And we do that by, we tell each other stories. That's what I'm doing right now, that's what we've been doing. We stand up here with PowerPoint and tell you a story. And I think this really is uh, leading to an inefficiency in the markets. And I think the way that news coverage follows um, <clears throat> follows this or, or drives this uh, is, is part of the equation. I'll tie news into stock fundamentals. How does news really relate to the kinds of stocks, um, the, the characteristics of stocks, and, and how they work? So here's our theoretical model. We uh, learn in basic investment classes a classical uh, capital market line, market index line, where there's a minimum variance or MV portfolio. It's lower return and lower risk than a market portfolio. And this is based on a set of assumptions, very few of which hold true. It's an, it's an elegant intellectual exercise and has very little to do with the way the world really works. <clears throat> so that market index or cap weighted index tends to be a pretty good portfolio. And the return to risk that you get is maximized by that portfolio. That's the whole objective. The whole objective is to get the most return per unit of risk. Here's the empirical world or the real world. When we observe portfolios and their volatility and their return, something quite different pops up. The market index is quite interior the efficient frontier. The minimum variance portfolio is extremely close to the efficient frontier. And the point here is the maximum return to risk is very close to that minimum variance portfolio, just a low risk portfolio. <clears throat> you probably can't read this. This is a timeline starting in um, 75 with Bob Haugen and Jim Hines. And they wrote a paper um, looking at risk and rates of return. Had a great difficulty getting this paper published. It took several years. Finally, it appeared in the Journal of Financial and Quantitative Analysis. And they said that this relationship between risk and return is backwards. Very hard to get this paper through. Bob Haugen and I wrote a paper <clears throat> in 91 in the Journal of Portfolio Management where I had, I had a breakthrough in optimization where I could optimize thousands of stocks in the late 80s and did some research on just creating low risk, minimum volatility portfolios with an optimizer. And this optimizer was super fast compared to what you could get at the time. Today it's, you know, nothing. But at that time it was a big relative advantage. I could find these incredibly low volatility portfolios and they kept outperforming. And it was so intriguing. Why is that true? So I tore the database apart, rewrote the code, and kept coming up with the same answer. Showed this to some consultants, and they wanted to know why. You know, it's not the below volatility. It must be that they're value stocks. It, they've got to be high dividend payers. You're, you're just obfuscating the reality of these real fundamentals. It's, it can't be based on volatility. A bunch of papers have appeared lately. This has gotten to be a hot area. Um, many of these papers are characterized by an academic paired with an empirical or a practitioner type person. <laughs> Databases are more readily available to people. Optimizers are more readily available. Data from around the world is available. This wasn't true 20 years ago, or it was certainly much, much less true. Um, there's a paper <clears throat> that Bob and I wrote in May. It's on the Social Science Research Network. And it's basically called low volatility outperforms. So we used to have these long, elegant academic titles. Now we've got boiling it down to simple things.
things like low risk wins, trying to get the, the message through. All right. <clears throat> Fairly simplistic test, starting in 1990, look back for two years, calculate the volatility of basically all developed uh, markets, the stocks in all the developed markets. So you've got a two year look back, monthly volatility, and then separated into five groups, the lowest risk on the left, the highest risk on the right. Own that portfolio for a month. Do it again. Reform the portfolio, each of these groups, by looking backwards for now, a, a, a two-year window that's rolled forward one month. Form the portfolio and then hold it for a month. Everything's out of sample. You're only looking backwards. It's easy to calculate volatility. You can use 180 weeks. You can use 60 months, you can use daily volatility if you want. Many people have tried different methods. It all, you can use beta, you can use residual risk, um, you can use straight up, straight up uh, standard deviation. Many people have tried different methods, it, it won't matter. The point is that after you own them, the higher risk stocks stay higher risk, or the higher risk portfolios. Well, that's pretty intuitive. High risk companies stay high risk, low risk companies stay low risk. There's always outliers, there's always, um, uh, something that happens, British Petroleum has a big accident. It goes from a relatively stable company to a lot of volatility for a while. But those are outliers. Okay, here, here's the, the catch. Now we look at their return after you've invested. The low volatility is outperforming the average by more than 600 basis points. The high volatility is underperforming the average by more than 600 basis points. This is across all equities. You can do this equal weighted or you can do it cap weighted. They're virtually the same result. So what's going on? <clears throat> I've got the size of these bubbles relating to news. How much news is out there? Now this is really a three dimensional thing. So the more stock market cap you have, the bigger your company is. The more news there is, Peter, and uh, yeah, went through it and showed that, that that's obvious with the regression. I think it was Macquarie did the red regression. More market cap, more news for Also, <clears throat> the more volatility you have, the more news stories there are. But it's not true that volatility and stock market cap cross. This is more of a, um, uh, just for a visualization, the volatility is related to news and stock market cap is related to news. This is in the paper, you can't read it, but generally on the left hand side are 22 countries, 21 countries. And we take the low risk minus the high risk and just calculate their risk in those bars. So low risk always is lower risk than high risk out of sample after you've selected. But here's the key, across all those countries, the low risk beats the high risk. So it's not happening in aggregate, it's happening in smaller chunks in each country. How can that possibly be? I mean, something has to be driving this effect that's massive. These aren't small numbers. That second line, which is close to the average, is 10% per year since 1990. Back to the very first picture, the objective was to get the highest return for the risk that you take. That's the sharp ratio. The sharp ratio of the low volatility portfolios relative to the high volatility is on the right. They win. They're providing much, much more return for the risk that you take. And this was extended to emerging. Uh, the other data was 1990. The emerging starts in 1998. Uh, across all of the emerging countries we've looked at, which are volatile, have fewer names, but it's still, the effect is still there. If you were to roll the sharp ratio, this is for all developed countries, and just do a rolling sharp ratio of the low volatility minus the high volatility, you have one little blip, and that was um, at the end of 99, where it goes negative. And we gave that period a special name. We sort of memorialized it. We called that the bubble. The word bubble was not in the 
common term in uh, investment or in academic uh, finance-related research. Now it is a common term. It was because of that. So other than that, you had higher return for risk. This was a pretty safe bet. This is just the return. And yes, there are a couple of periods, and this is just the US. So you can be wrong in terms of pure return um, for periods of up to around three years. I really like this view. The sharp ratio of the blue is the sharp ratio of the low risk stocks relative to the market. In other words, I've taken the market out, that's horizontal. Did the same thing for the high risk stocks in red. The high risk stocks are almost always below the market, the low risk stocks almost always above. It's a bad bet to own high risk stocks. It's a relatively good bet to own the lower risk stocks. So we've looked at this across countries, divided it up into emerging. We've looked at it for aggregate time periods. We've looked at it within each country on a rolling one year, three year, five year basis. This is a massive amount of confirming information. <laughs> Here, uh, this is the United States high risk portfolio right there. This is the S&P 500 at the center. This is the United States low risk portfolio right there. Each country I did the same thing for. I took uh, Canada, took the Canadian cap weighted index, and then the Canadian low volatility <laughs> portfolio. So they're all kind of on the same scale. And what you subtract is how much higher risk do I get above the benchmark when I go into the high risk portfolios? And then how much lower return? And if you look at these numbers, it's around 10%. These numbers are around 5 6% a year with substantially lower risk. Okay, well, it loses sometimes. That's the argument. I'm going to lose in an up market. I divided markets into down, neutral, and up just by sorting them and putting a third in each. So in the down markets, the low volatility does a lot better than the uh, high volatility. Neutral markets, it does better, but it lags. Uh, I'm sorry, this is the S&P 500, not the uh, high volatility. But it lags the S&P 500 in the up markets. So that's terrible. I mean, it's just awful. You're behind when the market's going up. Down markets, you get a good amount in the neutral markets. You still make positive alpha. In other words, you're still winning on a risk-adjusted basis. And that slope of that line is what we're going after. Table is uh, too small to read. United States, one, three, and five years. Global, one, three, and five. Emerging, one, three, and five. Here's the percentage times, or hit rate, that the uh, low volatility beats. So on a five-year basis, 94, 99, 100% in the emerging. These are the numbers, they're all 100. You're always lower risk. In other words, risk is really easy to manage in, in terms of once you diversify, it's a very persistent <laughs> effect. And that's because business models are relatively stable. It's hard to go from a utility business model to a high-tech healthcare over a year. In other words, people don't change like that. So once you're in a utility business model, certain things are set and your business model is relatively stable, and therefore your stock price is relatively stable. But the higher sharp ratios here, on a three-year basis, 93.8, global 94, and emerging 100%. Why is this going on? We can we'll take some more questions on this later, if you like. But basically, it's where I started. It's about stories, and it's about excitement. Exciting stocks are priced too high, and boring stocks are priced too low. Why? People are overconfident in the future of these exciting stocks. They perceive that Facebook, which has been doing great, is going to go forever. Remember Research in Motion? This was a top, top flight company five, six years ago. Commanded every corporation's 
mobile email applications. It had projections that were phenomenal. Anybody know the price today? Is it 293 or under? I mean, it's had a tremendous fall. We get overconfident in the future. And remember, the capitalism has a positive feedback. Where there's high return on investment, you attract competition. And we're forgetting about that. We're overconfident in our estimation because some of that comes in. Also, there's a lottery payoff for high rates. How many utility companies are going to go from $20 to 100 over a year? Zero. I mean, theoretically it could happen, but not. How many high-tech healthcare companies are going to go from 20 to 100? Some of them. If any company is going to go up five times, it's going to come from that new, exciting, high-risk area. That's where the winners are. But the losers are in that pond also. The big losers are out there. And the, high, the overpriced stocks are out there. So that's the excitement effect. I think that's driving a lot of it. I'm an equity manager. So as an agent, I have to compete with my peers and try to beat the index. Tracking error is a measure of deviating from the index, not a measure of how much return you get for the risk. So if I compete on tracking error, I'm forced to be inefficient in a Markowitz uh, CAPM model. I'm forced to because of these agency problems. <laughs> well, why not do this? Why not get California teachers and get a huge portfolio of shorting these high-risk stocks and a giant portfolio going long the low-risk stocks and manage your risk as well? It doesn't seem to happen. It seems like a pretty obvious strategy to me, but it doesn't happen. Some of that is their borrowing costs, and it's not as efficient as you would hope. How much of the S&P is held short? If, if the S&P long is 100%, and you added up all the short positions, what percentage in market cap do you think that is? I get numbers 10, 20, 30%. That's what you know. the market has 10% short volume against long volume. It's less than 2%. So people, although it's possible, they don't really use that shorting ability. And that's one of the reasons that this effect persists. Over here is what I think is a more theoretical argument, but I like it, and that's the high return on investment, attracts capital, attracts competition, and drives down the future return for those, those really glamorous stuff. This is just a, some of the, the lines, the trade-off lines. The low-risk quintile has a sharp ratio for these 20 years, 102. The cap-weighted index, 0.42. And you have a, a negative for the high-risk quintile. It works around the world. Global, this is a, uh, actually an optimized portfolio, not just an equally weighted quintile. So in the global portfolio against the MSCI world, you can achieve higher return, lower risk. In the emerging, which is really interesting, this is a, a high risk area. You can reduce the risk by about a third. And the pickup here was 400 basis points per year since 98. This is the IFA or international, and this is just domestic US. OK, now let's get down to tying this story to the excitement a little bit. As part of the paper, I was looking for ways to confirm this idea that excitement is related to volatility and, and what we've been talking about in terms of return. And they're ranked um, from uh, by cap and volatility. And then we rank the number of stories. Sorry, this is not the number of stories. This is how many analysts are covering these stocks. So what I, we know that a big company is going to get more analysts covering them. What I want to do is I want to adjust for the fact that it's a large company and then see how many analysts are covering them. In the regression line, you probably can't read it, but it, an R squared of 
37%. I do this year by year. These are the total number of analyst ratings. Here's the year 2000. Forget about these statistics. There's a beta on volatility and a beta on market cap. So the T-stat on volatility is uh, 3.2, and the T-stat on the market cap is 20. What this is basically telling me is that the higher the volatility, the more analysts cover the stock. So what are they? They're high volatility, they're exciting. Once you've allowed for the fact of the market cap, they're more exciting and more analysts are covering them. Well, that, that sort of makes sense. I mean, why would you talk about a company that's been in business for 80 years, hasn't changed anything, is paying out the same dividend, has had the same chairman for 18 years? There is no news there, and the analysts don't want to cover it. Let's do the same thing now with the data that's provided by Ravenback. They gave me all of the data on all stocks. I use the US portion. Going back to 2000, the same data that Peter was talking about. And I pulled out just for the top 1,000 stocks the number of news stories each month. They actually have it daily, but I aggregated it to monthly. And then I looked at the <laughs> market cap and the number of news stories where I converted that to a percentage. The reason for doing that is there were more news stories uh, in the last couple of years than there were in 2000 in their database. So that had to be converted to a percentage. But basically this is the ranked number of stories against the market cap. 35% R squared. Or in a table, here's the T statistics. We know that the the T-statistic on number of news stories to market cap is going to be significant each year. We just know that. Big cap companies get more stories. But look at these T-statistics. 5, 9, 8, 14, 11, 13, 7, 7. The lowest one is 6.1. If you put all the data together, these are T-stats of 30. So, more news is written about exciting volatile companies. Those companies underperform in the future. Now we've tied it together. Volatility and news and return. And underneath that is excitement and stories. Analysts telling stories, newspapers telling stories, people at parties telling stories to each other about what they just bought. That's how we communicate. And yet, we're being lulled into this trap over and over and over again. Just some quick fun, my guy. So the, the previous slide, except so the, what is your news story beta, regression beta? Is that now the beta volatility? Yes. Um, and it's, That's maybe mislabeled. That's the, the um, no. I've got the number of stories as predicted by the volatility beta and the cap. Okay, so the volatility is related to, sorry, the volatility is related to the number of stories. And the volatility was related to the number of analysts. Those were the two parallels. I didn't do a great job setting that up, apologize. But the point is, that once you've adjusted for market cap, there are more analysts covering volatile stocks. There are more news stories written about volatile stocks. Some other characteristics. These are some major countries. US, UK, France, Germany, Japan, Switzerland, down to the Netherlands. So basically the top 10 or so countries. The low risk quintile has bigger market cap than the high risk quintile. Makes sense, right? Bigger companies, more stable, true across the world. Sales grow. This is slightly counterintuitive, but the higher risk ones are actually growing their sales rapidly. 
The low risk ones are in these older business models and they're moving slowly. So their growth in sales is not great for these low risk models, these unexciting, boring companies. Earnings yield. So the high risk stocks on an earnings yield basis are crummy. So their sales are good and growing, but their earnings are crummy because they don't have any profits yet. Everybody makes this excuse about we're building ahead of the curve, right? We're building up the infrastructure so that we can be profitable five years from now. It's the only rational thing to do. You have to trust us and so on. These low-risk stocks, you get a lot of earnings for what you pay. The PE, the PE is low here and high here. This is the reverse earnings yield. But basically, you get a lot more for the low-risk stocks. Profit margins. Why? Because these companies aren't making anything. These have crummy profit margins. These guys have been doing this business for 80 years in a textile company down in South Carolina. And they ship away expenses Every little rough edge that they can chip off, they chip off. And they become efficient in running their business. So although their sales are not that great, they're cheap and they're making money. Not only in the US, but this is across the world. This is amazing that the fundamentals confirm so much across uh, countries. Share turnover. Do you think these exciting stocks trade more? Let's say you've got two companies. They both have 100 million shares outstanding. One is a boring utility company. The other is a high-tech healthcare. Both have 100 million shares outstanding. The share turnover of the exciting stocks, the high-risk stocks, will be about double the share turnover. In other words, maybe 200 million trade a year in the high-risk stock, and only 100 million will trade a year in the lowest. So if I was on Wall Street and trying to scare up business and I made commissions, I'd want to focus my stories and my analysts on the stuff that was exciting and turning over. Okay, this is now what I think is really powerful because I'm going to tie in the news stories to the fundamentals where I'm doing a regression and holding market cap equal. So it's a two, two uh, things are being held. One will be market cap, and then the other is one of these variables, earnings risk, trading volume, price, and so on. And what I'm looking at is the number of news stories. Okay? So when I do that against market cap, a 200 T stack. Market cap and, and, and news stories are related. But when I look at earnings risk and market cap, the higher earnings risk companies have higher news story coverage. More news to the companies with volatile earnings. This is, these are ordered by absolute T stat. So that's a very powerful. The companies that have earnings that are bouncing around from quarter to quarter get a lot more coverage. Trading volume. Companies with high trading volume where it's share turnover that we look at. But that high trading volume tend to be volatile and they get a lot more coverage. There's high interest in those companies. Price. Price is negative. This means that once you've adjusted for cap, the low price stocks tend to get more coverage. So the low price tends to have more volatility. These are names that anybody could buy. It's not a $400 stock. You could buy these for $5 a share. So that T-stat is negative. Profit margin, this ties into what we just looked at across the world, profit margin is negative. These companies that are exciting and have news stories have low profit margins. Sales to price. It's relatively positive. These are companies that do have sales, they just don't have earnings or profit. I mean, they're not profitable yet in their margins. Sales, generating sales, and the excitement around this new company generating sales generates news stories. Here's three measures of risk. Volatility, just standard deviation, beta, and trading range. And trading range is just how 
much a stock moves over a month relative to its price. What's the high and the low divided by price? Just another measure of volatility. All of those relate to more news. Earnings yield is negative. So stocks with low earnings yield, they tend to be more young and exciting. They're not producing earnings yet. So there's a negative association with that. If you're a high PE, you're probably also getting some more news stories. But now that this has been connected, I mean, the analyst stuff and the news stuff is confirmatory evidence, but nobody's ever done that before. And tied that in with risk and return and the fundamentals and done it across all of these countries and over time, this is an incredibly powerful story. And it's all pretty much telling the same story. Yes. I'm sorry, maybe I'm missing. How do you control the market cap when you're doing the, let's say you're doing the price, and how do you control the market cap? So the question is, how do we uh, adjust for market cap? Yeah. So I regress the number of news stories on two variables. One is market cap, and the other is price. From that, I look at the slope on the price and calculate what's the t-statistic. How significant is that? And on price, it's negative 63. I mean, that's enormous. So this says that holding market cap equal, there are more news stories for the smaller price stocks. Have more news stories. Holding cap equal stocks that trade more have more news stories. Low price stocks have more news stories. Low profit stocks have more news stories. High sales to price, more news stories. Volatile stocks have more news stories. And high PE, or low earning yield, high PE stocks have more news stories when you're accounting for size. And once you clear that up, these are just enormous. People write news stories about exciting companies. The exciting companies are newer more volatile, their fundamentals are generally weaker in a classical sense, they're weaker. And that's the way the world is working. I'm not sure, I wasn't trying to predict anything here with news stories, but there's a lot of tags in, in their data. I just haven't got to it yet. And you could associate some of those tags with the fundamentals and maybe forecast out some period of time in the future. <laughs> My stuff has tended to do longer term, meaning months to years kinds of inefficiencies. This data can certainly be used for real time stuff. But you know what I'm going to look at is what are the kinds of trending in the news stories or trending in the tags that might be related to future uh, future returns. How are we on time? Take some questions. Yes. Um, the time frame that you have here has seen a lot of change in market structure and trading volumes about about 500% over this period from HFT and changes in structure. How did you account for that in the analysis? So the question is, given there's a lot of change in the underlying uh, structure of the world, essentially, um, how do you account for that? And in the news, I'm not accounting for that particularly. In the fundamentals, um, you can break this down into five-year segments. And it's the same in the five-year segments. I wrote a paper in 91 that I mentioned in the beginning. That looked at data from 72 in the US to, uh, I think, 88 or 90, somewhere in there. And it's in the Journal of Portfolio Management. So that window on the US showed the same stuff. Um, some of the other people, um, Baker, um, uh, Brendan uh, Bradley and uh, Workler went back. They, they had some data going back into the 1920s in the U.S. They found similar things. So I have actually had that uh, that critique. Well, this is data mined. It's only for the last 22 years. You know, that's look. This is across all these different countries and all of these different sub periods. And that's why I did that rolling analysis on three-year windows, five-year windows. Um, this is not a short-term thing. It's related to how we judge investments in the equity world, and we judge them as if we're buying a car. 
you know, is it exciting? Is it red? Does it have a moon roof? Does it have navigation? Um, we buy companies like we buy the features on a car. The way that we should buy companies is kind of like the way we buy bonds. Just tell me the critical things. What's the yield to maturity? What's the duration of this thing? What's the convexity? In other words, tell me the mathematical properties of this investment. Don't try to sell me on the chairman has got a great looking wife or, you know, the, uh, the, the latest hotshot scientist just, just got 17 new patents. You know, that's not an investment. And we keep making this mistake and people are starting to wake up to this. There's some ETFs traded on this. Um, there's serious money in the world going into this. But I, I would say we're kind of at that, we're two years down the road in terms of serious money going in. Now I believe you'll see a hundred billion move into this in the next couple of years. And after that, I think it, once it starts to move, I think you'll see a lot of money moving from cap-weighted type strategies into these type strategies. Yes? You are looking at the lowest volatility and the highest volatility bucket. So these represent the two extreme, right? However, for the moderate volatility you know, stocks, is that true that uh, high risk means high return? In terms of? In terms of the, for like the moderate volatility stock, is it still true that high, high risk means high return? <coughs> The, which is different from your, your, uh, your conclusion. Your conclusion is, okay, low risk means high, high return. Low risk means high return within an equity market. Right. But there's an asset allocation question, which is different, which is across asset classes, does high risk perform well? I'm still talking about within the same equity. Within asset the market. same equity, <laughs> I've broken this down into 5 percentiles, deciles, quintiles, and halves. I've looked at market cap weighted and equally weighted and log cap weighted. You could, you could just take the lowest, simplest thing in the world, try this yourself, go to Bloomberg, go back to the beginning of 2012, take the S&P 500 and take the lowest beta stocks, just grab their beta and then grab their year-to-date return and sort it and do an average or a cap weighted average or a median on that. And you'll find even though the S&P is up about what, 16 this year? I don't know where we are today, but let's say, let's say it's up 16. Even though it's an up market, you'll find that that low risk half has outperformed the high risk half. And you know, you, you could do it more elegantly, but that's just so simple. Yes? Uh, do you think is there any conflicts between your main conclusion and the side effect, or is there anything to reconcile with the, the traditional size, you know, small cap outperform large cap? Question is this traditional conclusion that, that I'm laughing because there's a story behind it. Um, the traditional conclusion that small cap <laughs> outperforms large cap. And there was a paper by. Uh, Fama and French in 92. And I was at a, a conference in Chicago, the University of Chicago, called the CRISP Conference, Center for Research and Securities Pricing. And I got a copy of uh, Gene Fama's paper. And I looked through it and I went and did, remember Lotus 1, 2, 3? I took the table in the back of his paper and he had the beta of stocks and their size and their return. In every decile of size, the low beta stocks outperformed. So what happened, this is a little hard to picture, you need a three dimension. As you move over in size, you do move up in return. Because, of, I'm sorry, the other way. As you, as you move up in size, your returns come down. So the small cap stocks do have a slight preference over the large cap stocks. But remember, they also have higher volatility and higher trading costs. But we'll hold that aside and say small cap is outperforming. If you looked within the small cap by beta, low beta beat high beta in the small cap. Low beta beat high beta in the next decile. So if you plotted this with the stripes, what you saw was once you controlled for size, 
Low beta worked in every single one of his deciles. And that, ta that table didn't make it into the final paper. He cut that table. So I had a draft, and I started sending this around saying, this is unbelievable. He's going he's to shoot himself in the foot. And then they didn't publish that table. <laughs> yes. So in, in this slide, you're saying <clears throat> that the TSAT of news stories relative to volatility standardized to market cap is 40 or 50. Did you then try applying that to your, your original premise of saying, well, you know, the only driving thing or the driving thing that you're, you're using to differentiate is volatility? Did you try also taking into account news volatility? <coughs> For the number of news stories to see so, that. so the question is adjusting for market cap and finding the, this volatility related to news stories. Uh, have I adjusted using the news beta? I didn't know about news beta, but until Peter um, uh, showed us that, I thought that was very interesting. And I'm still not sure about the calculation, but I think I think that that would be another. You you adjusted for what uh, size and uh, value that. So he used the Bama French factors and then added the news beta in. And I think uh, I'd like to try that. I want to see, uh, I think that could be really interesting. And, and more generally, you haven't tried to take any of the, any of the news information and apply it directly to how you cite great stocks about volatility and things like that. No, this was, this was an idea that I had laid in the paper. Uh, just because we had had a connection and they told me about their data and I just said, I wonder if news stories related to, um, is related to volatility, is related to return. And the first thing is you have to adjust the cap, but once that happened, it just popped out year by year by year with very significant numbers. Now these T-stats are enormous because remember there's 144 months and a thousand stocks each month. So you've got 144,000 observations. That's why these numbers are giant. You've just got an incredible sample size. So if you break it into years, the T-stats will come down, but they, they're all going to be high on these fundamentals. Yes? You still get the volatility premium if you adjust volatility to uh, news? So would you get this premium if you adjusted for the news? In other words, do news completely explain the premium? I think that the news beta is probably correlated with volatility I didn't need news beta, just the stories uh, measure. Uh, I don't know. If I adjusted for that, what would happen? I, I actually don't know. But there's, there's a lot to do here. I mean, this is this is the you know beginning of the age of big data, and what that means is it's not just the size of the data; it's the complexity of the data. And what we're all trying to do is take this complex data and boil it down so it fits in our SQL databases so that we can run traditional tests, right? You take your data, you create all sorts of scores, but they go into a traditional framework of analytics. That model isn't flexible enough to handle big data. Big data is stuff that's on the internet, tick data, uh, you know, news coverage, video. Um, th there's all of this stuff that needs to be automatically collected and massaged so that the analytics can go after it. And you know that's that's where I think we're going in terms of research. And I think the methods are just archaic compared to the size of the data. So um, all we're doing is we're sampling, you know, they've got the news stories and, and we've just begun really looking at that. Um, so five years from now I think we'll have all sorts of conclusion conclusions on, on news and how useful it is. Yes? The, the new samples that you use, did you do any filtering by you know, the, the level of you know, novelty? Or, you know? I used, you have the relevance score, and so I created a couple of tables. One was higher relevance. Because this was going into an academic paper, I didn't want to explain that. I wasn't trying to data mine. But it's true that the more, the higher the relevance score, the stronger this effect is. So uh, I just didn't want to, you know, 
be accused of data mining or make it too complicated. This is really, this was a really pretty simple, um, straightforward. This table is not in the um, paper. And these, these kinds of slides didn't make it into the paper. But I think it's really interesting because it says fundamentals are related to volatility and news, and it ties together pretty nicely. Yes? Here, the topic covered in your, your presentation is very interesting to me, and it reminds me of a uh, as on a case strategy called the risk parity strategy. It is. How that's could you, how could you, uh, that's exactly you, it. Would you Look, we, we started this whole thing. I don't want to go back to the beginning, but I started this whole thing with that return to risk angle, that line, that capital market line that we're supposed to achieve. That's a risk parity line, right? Invest in things that give you high return to risk, and then you can change your weights and move up and down that line. <laughs> Here, simple example, rough numbers, you can do it yourself. The low volatility, once you create a portfolio, has about 30% less risk than an equity portfolio. So let's say you take a 60-40 mix of stocks and bonds. That 60-40 mix of stocks and bonds over the next 10 years is going to return ballpark 6%. You make up your own numbers, but it's not going to be great. If you go to 80-20, 80, 80 low volatility stocks and 20 bonds, now you've got 20 more percent that you can pull out of bonds and shove into equity. What's the premium going to be between equity and bonds over the next 10 years? I'm going to use, it's going to be big. I'm going to use a round number, but you can adjust it. I'm going to say it's 10% a year for the next 10 years that stocks will be bonds, because I don't think bonds are going to do well. If you have 20% more exposure in your pension fund, you're going to be a 60-40 mix by 200 basis points a year. And remember, you know, New York State, California, Virginia, Florida, they would kill for 10 basis points. There's 200 out there available in liquid, practical portfolios. Now, I'm not saying, you know, take all your money from cap weighted and shift it over to low volatility overnight. But if you're not 30% in this five years from now, you're going to be behind the times. This is, this is David Swenson for the next 10 years. At Yale, he created this model of how to put together asset allocation portfolios. This is cheap and easy way to add value, and it's really with the risk parity idea. Get more return for the risk that you take. Thank you. I think I've eaten up all my time. Thank you very much.